nation's favourite antiques experts. Let's get fancy. Behind the wheel of a classic car. I'm always in turbo. And a go to scar Britain for antiques. Hot stuff. The aim to make the biggest profit at auction. <gasps> but it's no mean feat. There'll be worthy winners. Cha-ching. Oh, my goodness. And valiant losers. Mm, bonkers. Will it be the high road to glory? You are my ray of sunshine. Oh, stop it. Or the slow road to disaster. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> This is Antiques Road Trip. Yeah. It's the penultimate chapter in the story of road trip ramblers Margie Cooper and Ochuko Ojuri. Where are we today, chaps? Worcester. 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 Nice place for a jaunt in your 1962 Jag. That was before seatbelts for mandatory. I've noticed Americans can't say Worcester sauce. Does I don't like Worcester no. sauce. Oh, I love Worcester I sauce. I put it in a casserole oh. once because one of the great chefs told me to and I didn't like it. I can't it. get enough of that. Really? Yeah. What is it exactly? No one knows, Margie. It's a trade secret. But we do know that the locals are friendly. There's so, a cow um, there. Was that a ball? Oh, the little calves, Lord. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh dear, I'm not so keen about those. You don't see many of those in London, Margie. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> Whoa! This is like we're on safari. <laughs> Just wait till you see the lions in the next field. <laughs> Last time out, R2 had a right old knees up. It was happy hour for London lad Juco. I'm excited. I think you can tell. I'm, I'm almost nervous energy here. While Chester dealer Margie went straight for the hard stuff. My surname's Cooper. <laughs> and, of course, Cooper's made barrels, didn't they? And that party spirit rolled on into the auction. Well done. With a clean sweep of whopping profits for both of them. Oh, I feel emotional now. What a wonderful auction that was. Oh! It was fast. There was one bit when I went one more and you went, don't be greedy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was getting a bit grumpy by that. <laughs> well, I don't know why. Because after starting this trip with the customary £200, Margie now has £534.66p in her pocket. And a third of that was just from the last auction. Mind you, Chuko also began with 200 made that much and more on the last one. He now has the lead with £605.52. It's all going very well. You know what? Every road trip I do, I think, oh, that was the best one. And I think this one... I'm going to say the same thing. The thing with me is I feel fresh the whole time. I don't feel tired and I've not moaned the whole time. Well, I can moan, but I moan nicely. One of the best I know, Margie. <laughs> Our pair's journey began in Liverpool and then headed south, hugging the Welsh border as they went. They're now entering the West Country, heading for a final showdown in Didcot. Ooh, look at the scenery there. Lovely. For this leg of the trip, we'll shop all the way to the county town of Gloucestershire but we start off in Worcestershire at Evesham, where R2 are just pitching up at shop number one, the Twyford Antique Centre. Right, here we go. Here we go, after you. Age before beauty. No comment. <laughs> Wise move, Juco. There's plenty of room for them to spread out in here. Two floors packed full of treasures. And with over a grand in cash between them, it's a safe bet that one or two items won't be staying here for very much longer. Look at this. Whoa. Seed dispenser. You'd be thinking to yourself, who needs that? Someone who wants to dispense seeds. Shall I buy a shooting stick? How much is it? They sell, don't they? 15 quid. Of course, she moves fast when she wants to. God. Watch me fall over backwards. <laughs> don't do it, Margie. I'm not sitting on that. I'm going to fall over. Common sense prevails. Now, has anyone found anything of substance yet? Oh, these look tasty. What have you spotted? Look at these colours. And the enamelling, absolutely immaculate. They'd be coffee spoons, they'd be 1900, 1910, something like that. It's got hammer there, Morris Hammer. So they were based in Bergen in Norway. Great maker. But it doesn't have them marked as sterling silver. And if they were, I'd buy this immediately. £270. Ah. Uh. So, are you tempted, Juco? No. <laughs> Not today. Not quite ready to part with some big money just yet. Now, how's our Margie getting along? 
Ah, oh, bits of silver. Like bits of silver. No, I'd never have guessed. Oh my goodness, he's cute, isn't he? Look at this pincushion. Look how they're usually tiny. These little chickens. Look at the size of him. He's a big fat one. That's a bit personal, Margie. Oh, and he's Chester, which is nice. Chester's always a very good hallmark. He's 1907, so he's like 100 and years old. But here comes the shock. Are you ready? It's £310, and there's no way I can make a profit on that, but I'm putting him back, but I've enjoyed seeing him. Looks like having all that cash has made both of them nervous. Well, hello. Hello there, Marty. <laughs> Imagine if we lived next door to each other. We could do this in the fence. I want to show you something. This way. Look, you like these, don't you? Hey, they you? look familiar. Wooden dumbbells, eh? He did quite well with them earlier in the trip. Do you think you might be... Lucky again. I wasn't lucky. <laughs> it's my keen eye that spotted them. Are they heavy? No. Why do you think I'm doing that? <laughs> you don't want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, do you? I know, but that's no good to anybody, is it? <laughs> don't end up buying those. No, no, no. We can't be lucky twice. You can't be lucky at all if you don't buy something. <laughs> oh, this looks interesting. Oh, Victorian stone paperweight. I love to buy stuff, not only with my eyes, but with my hands as well. And this is such a lovely tactile object. I love it. I'd have that at home on my desk, in the office. Just a great thing, isn't it? And it's got a very striking contemporary look to it. And it's practical. But I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> it's five pounds. I'm ahead. I'm not that much ahead. Five pounds, I can't lose with that. Mine. In that case, <laughs> off to the till with you, then. Andy. Hi. I've got something in my pocket. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I found this. All right. Hmm, little um, paperweighty yeah. type thing. I'm super generous today. It's got five pounds on it. Mm-hmm. Five pounds. Thank you very much. And I'm going to stick this back in my pocket. You can do that. Thank <laughs> you very much. OK, Take nice care. seeing you. That barely troubled the budget, then. Take your remaining £600 and be off with you. Back inside, what's Margie up to? At the moment, I'm just eyeing this little fellow. Not unusual. Everybody knows who made this. Well, I do. It's made by Dalton. This is a harvest jug for beer. You've got all these applied marks of things you'll find in the countryside. Windmills, men hunting... A really nice thing. Now, it's got a little bit of nibbling, but you would have if you were, like, 140 years old. <laughs> but for £15, I'm sure it's going to make some money. So it's coming with me. Better go and have a word, then. Andy. <laughs> oh, hi. I am not going to give you any haggling or stress. Oh, wow. <laughs> ah. And I'm going to pay you £15 for that. I doubt that Andy will be shutting the shop early today. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Bye-bye. That leaves her with just shy of £520. They're hardly breaking the bank, are they? Now, taking a break from shopping, Truco has headed to Malvern. At the height of the Second World War, with the country facing the threat of the German army, this famous spa town came under invasion, not by enemy forces, but as part of a secret project to turn the tide of the war. Hi, Mike. Hello. What a glorious place this is. Historian Mike Burstow can spill the beans on this classified mission. A thousand scientists who were working on top-secret matters suddenly arrived here in Malvern. The locals had no idea what was going on. Nobody knew why they were here. So who really were they? They were employed by the Ministry of Aviation to work on radar for the Royal Air Force and for the Fleet Air Arm. And the college here was a perfect site. Developing radar was a high priority for the British military, and so their telecommunications and radar establishment had been secretly working on this groundbreaking technology long before the outbreak of war. But with the threat of a German attack on their base near Bournemouth, they were ordered to relocate. So, on one day in March, 
1942, the entire operation, lorry loads of equipment and around one and a half thousand staff descended on Malvern, setting up base here at the college. How did they go down with the locals? They were largely resented. What are you doing here? Why, why aren't you fighting in the war? And of course they couldn't say a thing about it. The whole area was cordoned off under the Emergency Powers Act and the Ministry of Works had to go around to every house and say, if you have a spare bedroom, you must release it for one of these incoming people. So that mystery must have been really irritating yeah. to the locals. Disruption to townsfolk aside, there was important top secret work to be done, and this room was the nerve centre for the project. The superintendent, AP Rowe, was allocated this as his office, and he was instrumental in making sure that the scientists spoke to the servicemen, and that was unusual. The military would come down from London, and the scientists would gather, and they'd discuss the problems they were trying to solve with these radars. So this room and his influence was absolutely vital. In his book, After the War, he recounts looking out through the window behind us there and saying, if the war is won, it will be won from the playing fields of Morven. Wow. But it was in the college's laboratories where the hard graft would be done. Here, hundreds of scientists strive to improve this vital tool in the war effort whilst devising ways to jam the radar systems of the enemy. We're in the top of the Preston Labs, which is now the modern science block of Morven College. But this was used by Bernard Lovell, later Sir Bernard Lovell, and his radar team. This actual room? This actual room. These objects here are just tiny parts of the whole radar system. This one comes from 1943, and it's the display that the navigator looked at, and he yeah. could see the radar scanning on it, and it took a picture of the ground. Whether it was cloudy or nighttime, they could see where they were going. By bouncing radio waves off a target, the system can be used to detect its distance and velocity. It made planes more accurate on bombing runs and, crucially, pinpointed the location of German U-boats attacking Britain's supply ships. This is looking at me. That's a magnetron. Yeah. Um, it's the device that can make microwave pulses at high power. And before that time, we only had low-frequency radars, which weren't very precise in location. That was more than ten times more powerful now, today, the modern version of that is what powers your microwave oven. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst design and testing took place in the college labs, most of the equipment was built elsewhere by TV and radio manufacturers. But to keep up with demand from the military, Morven set up its own engineering unit. Now, that engineering unit was populated with local people, men and women working on the shop floor with lathes and the wiring shops. Once they were involved, the locals then began to understand that what they were doing was important. Even those people couldn't share it with their families. Yeah. So, yeah, a, a real hidden history. Yeah. After the war, the secret was revealed and the huge contribution radar made towards victory became clear, thanks in no small part to the unsung heroes that worked here. Meanwhile, Margie's on the move again and still coming to terms with her sizeable £519 budget. If I saw something I really liked, you know, I can afford to buy it, which often at this stage you're not at that point. But if I don't find that item, I'd be far better to not spend that much money. <sighs> but is that the coward's way out? Not for me to say, Margie. I'll lose sleep over this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a worry. Her next port of call is Upton upon Seven, where she has a pressing appointment at this place, Bits and Bobs. Now, that's an encouraging sign. Oh, this looks nice and interesting. Hello. Hello, you're Anne. I am. I'm Margie. Hi. And I'm Tim. Now, that's that out of the way. Let's have a look around, shall we? Oh, that's cute, isn't it? It's not the biggest shop in the world, but what it lacks in square footage, it makes up for in quality. Lovely things in here, and plenty of them. And all within easy reach. Huh. Oh, my goodness. Oy. I'm very good at hitting things coming out of glass cabinets. You can't take her anywhere, Anne. Well, that's interesting. 
It's a money box, cast iron money box. Birmingham and Uni Municipal Castle. Yeah. <laughs> Birmingham and Municipal Bank. <laughs> Got there eventually. The idea is obviously you save money, a child would save money. And I think you have to go to the bank, they've got the key, and then they let you have all your savings. They took pocket money seriously back in the day. It's probably like 1930s, 1940s, and it's 15 pounds. Oh, I'll have that. Okie dokie then, moving on. What else have you spotted? What's this? Oh, lacrosse stick. That's an old one, isn't it? Oh, look, it's got the name of the chap who owned it. K.I. Horn. He's burnt that on, hasn't he? To make sure nobody pinched his stick. You can't be too careful. Here we go. We've got the maker's name, which is really nice, isn't it? Hattersley and Sons. Specialist in lacrosse equipment for over 100 years. Still going to this day. It's got a real feel of age about it. Another plus is it's £15. I'm going to take that and put it on the desk and have a think. You do that. Still not making much of a dent in your kitty, though, are you? Anything else? No, I'm not really into porcelain and stuff. But that looks a really interesting jug. It's to do with the Crimean War and it's called a patriotic jug. So it was a way of collecting money for the people who were horribly injured in the Crimean War. Originally sold by the Royal Patriotic Fund, set up in 1854 to help widows and orphans of the war. In just a year, it raised over half a million pounds, about 46 million in today's money. And it's not just that one. You've got two others at the back as well, one of which is badly damaged there. And it's got this horrible age marking there, look. That gets underneath the glaze and nothing you can do. Mm. But it's got really interesting transfer printed scene of what was going on there. These have been £210, which would be of no interest to me, but there's a little sign on it that says <laughs> half price. 105 for all three. Could that tempt you to spend big? It is a risk. I wonder if I have a word with Anne, see if we can go a bit lower. I know it sounds a bit cheeky after I'm seeing half price. A quick call to the dealer should answer that. Hello, I've got Margie here and she's interested in your um, three jugs that are on top of the cabinet and she wondered what your very, very best price could possibly be. Not a smidgen less? <laughs> I will pass that on. <laughs> OK. How much is it? 99. <laughs> <laughs> it's all money off, Margie. Could we do anything on the group to get to help this poor soul? Not much of a smidgen, but a little. <laughs> yeah. One, two, five. Yeah. And I'm going to buy them. Brilliant. Nice one, Anne. I'd say let's call the jugs 95 and make it 15 each for the other two. And still £395 left. So, with those being sent on to the auction, it's time you headed off and picked up your pal. Imagine if we did this trip on planes. <laughs> Private jets. Is it work with a helicopter? It would, actually, wouldn't it? Just yeah, provided you could land in the middle of a town. <laughs> oh, yeah. A vintage jag isn't good enough, eh? <laughs> Nighty night. A new day and a new county. We're in Gloucester. Wow, it's all right round here, isn't it, Margie? <laughs> oh, God, I love it. Cheese country, innit? Apologies to any Gloucestonians for those accents. They do this cheese rolling. So what is that? Is well, that like with the chasing the ball? But well, they send, they send this cheese, a, a round of cheese down a hill. They're running and, and they're thrown all over the shop. No. It looks really, really I'm dangerous. I'm not into that. I prefer to just chill on a beach. <laughs> A <laughs> Somebody That's... bring you a double yeah. a glass of sandwich. Yeah. I mean, back in the day, you know, they, did, they didn't have much to entertain themselves, did they? Well, there were no antique shopping. Nothing was old back then. We're at a crucial stage now. Are you playing tactics? Yeah. I get quite nervous when I'm with you because I know that you've got a sharp, sharp mind and you're ticking all the time. You're no, doing... but you... Not a sharp mind. You... I can't remember what happened yesterday. Let me remind you, Margie. You spent £140 on a money box, a lacrosse stick, three Crimean war jugs and another jug, harvest this time. I'm sure it's going to make some money. 
so it's coming with me. So, you have just shy of £395 to spend today. Your mate, on the other hand, only spent a fiver on a paperweight. This is such a lovely tactile object. Meaning he still has a shade over £600 left. So you've done a little bit more, haven't you? How did you get on in your shot? Well, I'm all right. I'm quietly confident, but I'm not telling you anymore. OK, wow! <laughs> Look at you! So good luck for you, mate, in your Thank next you. shot. She means that sincerely, folks. Later, they'll be taking all their goodies off to an auction in Bristol, but before that, we've got Gloucestershire to explore, starting in Tewkesbury. Where, having deposited Margie somewhere along the route, Chuko has some shopping to do at the Malt House Emporium. A bit of a one-stop shop, this. Everything from very nice antiques to more eclectic and out-there items. Something for the garden? They've got you covered. Need a plane? Yep, they've got those too. <laughs> so many different bits and pieces in this shop, a real mishmash with new and old unusual stuff. I've seen the Spice Girls. I hope you got their autographs. <laughs> Having only parted with the fiver so far, our man with deep pockets could really do with thinking a bit bigger. Not quite what I had in mind. Keep looking. Oh, something's caught my eye. I like this. Ponjot. That's like a mantique, a boy's toy. It has to be mid-century, 1940s, 1950s, and it's in great condition. It's got all its period sort of colours on it and paints, and it's really together. This sail looks new, so I guess partly restored. Oh, it's got a nice weight to it. It's got all the trimmings, everything but a price tag. All handcrafted, good condition. God, I think I've sold it to myself. Right, I'm going to go and see if I can find a price. For that, you'll need to talk to the man at the helm. Vance. Hugo, how are you? I'm good. I love your yacht. It's cool, isn't it? Yeah. I've literally just brought it in. I think it's really nice. I think it's a real handsome piece. Um, how much? It needs to be around sort of mid-50s, I reckon, 55. I've got 45 for you. Now, give me a chance. I'm going to start counting the money out. <laughs> That's confidence for you. <laughs> Yeah, go on. 45. Ah, oh, look at that. Top man, Vance. And that brings his budget down to £555. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chuka. You're a kind man. Good luck with it. With good luck and prevailing wind, we'll see that again at the auction. For now, Captain Chuko is off to wherever the breeze takes him. Meanwhile, Margie's delayed her shopping. She has other chores to attend to. She's come to the Gloucestershire spa town of Cheltenham to visit the birthplace of one of the town's most famous Victorian residents, the composer Gustav Holst. But it's not music on the menu today. Oh, look! Oh, oh, I, feel, I feel underdressed! Oh, no, don't be silly. We can sort that out. Come oh, in. This house, restored to how it was when the composer lived here in the 1870s, can give a flavour of Victorian middle-class domestic life. And, under the charge of curator and lady of the house, Laura Kinnear, well, the way you're dressed, you're definitely downstairs. Oh, well, I'm not surprised, really. <laughs> Come on, then, let's get started. I know my place. <laughs> Margie's here to see the huge changes that 19th century innovation brought to the beating heart of the house, the kitchen. Actually, it doesn't look that different to today in here. In some <laughs> in a ways, way, yeah. it? This would have been the way that Victorian kitchens were organised, with this pine table in mm. the middle that would have been scrubbed regularly. Um, but there were no fitted cupboards. As you no. can see, the fitted kitchens, they didn't come in until the 20th century. Right. But it was very much designed around the range. Yeah. So that changed dramatically. You've got an enclosed fire now, what we call a, a closed range, much more efficient for baking. Mm. You also had the plumbing, so having a mains water supply connected to your scullery really changed things. So you weren't going out uh, to the street, to the pump, lugging buckets full of water for mm. your washing up. And also refrigeration. Yeah. So um, before this time, you know, it was very hard to keep things really cold. So you had things like ice boxes in the Victorian times. Along with these major improvements to the kitchen, a huge number of smaller labour-saving devices came to the market. 
This was the start of our love affair with the kitchen gadget, and the Victorians couldn't get enough of them. We've got the marmalade slicer for making your marmalade, oh, and that is actually quite an effective tool. I bet tool. that's good, yeah. Mincer. Yeah. I'm just looking at this. Mm. That looks like a bit of a silly invention. Well, yes, it's almost like a, just a, a chopper, a mechanised chopper. chopper. I mean, how much easier it would have been made chopping vegetables, I'm not sure, things like your carrots and your onions. So it's just Victorian in inventions that really made life easier. Absolutely, really, really uh, changed things for people, particularly in a house like this, when mm. you have uh, just one maid of all work. The mistress would have had to help a little bit. But for the day-to-day, -day, they would have been relying on quite a young maid. Yeah. yeah. Someone like you. <laughs> Despite these newfangled contraptions, a maid's life at this time was a hard one. From getting up early to light the range and prepare all the meals, to doing the weekly laundry and the all-important scrubbing of the front step. Now, I think it's high time the help knuckled down, don't you? So, Mum, you're having ladies for afternoon tea. Absolutely, So, yes. would you like me to make something for you? I'd love you to make me some Welsh cakes. Right, so, if you can guide me, I will mm. start. Yes, yeah, so, so we're eight ounces of flour, please. So, these are original Victorian scales with original weights. They're quite accurate. Ooh. Yeah, that's Hooray! perfect. Got it, got well it, got done. it. What now, Mum? <laughs> well, we need a little bit of baking powder in that if we want them to rise. Good old baking powder. Baking powder was perhaps the ingredient of the 19th century that changed food um, because it was invented by Alfred Bird. I don't know whether you've heard of uh, yes. Bird, Bird's Custard. Bird's Custard. Yes. Oh, wow. So his wife, Elizabeth, was allergic to yeast. Yeast was used in the past to make things rise. Yes. Um, but it wasn't that effective. You had to put a lot of work into it if you wanted your cakes to rise. Lovely. Lovely. Maybe a little bit more flour, yes. A little bit more flour. Yes. I'm a very experienced 17-year-old <laughs> cook. <laughs> the kitchen remained the busiest room in the house well into the Edwardian era. That's it. Lovely. During the 20th century, kitchens in new homes became smaller as gas cookers and washing machines replaced ranges and sculleries and fewer young women were willing to endure the drudgery of domestic service. But let's see how our new girl is working out. Oh, they look lovely. Yeah. They have done well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to... Cos I know what I did, I'm going to get a small one. Mmm. <laughs> mm. Not bad, are they? They're nice. Very nice. Although I say it myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, that's my, my guests now. If you'll excuse me. Certainly. <laughs> she got... I'm off before she makes me do anything else. <laughs> I wouldn't expect a glowing reference from your previous employer, Margie. <laughs> Away from our domestic goddess, our other expert is feeling a little anxious. This shop has to be good. It's my last chance to buy something special. And I'm really praying that I find the thing that connects with me in there and also that I make a lot of money from. That's always the plan. He's off to the historic city of Gloucester, famed for its impressive Norman cathedral and doubly so for its cheese. Also home to this fine establishment, Choco's last port of call. As the name suggests, there are two floors full of exciting treasures to discover. And with £555 to his name, money should be no impediment for our man. A load of tools here, a load of stuff from the 90s. Finding the right thing is another matter. I'm a bit nervous. Ah, a bit squeaky bum time. Maybe you shouldn't have left it to the last minute. Wow, look at that. What a handsome fellow. Modest as ever. Not me, the mirror. I love stuff like this and it often gets overlooked because it's so simple looking. It's not fancy, but that's exactly what I love about it. And it's got weight to it and that's how you can tell that it's really got age. This is going to be 1930s, latest 1950s. Oh, whoa! <laughs> Very nearly seven years' bad luck there. It's got an oak frame, beveled mirror, it's got this lovely kind of tape black inside, which gives you that lovely angular shape. Really simple, pure, strong design. Unticketed, however. If I can get it at the right price, maybe I'll put a few bits together, but that is something to really think about. That stood out to me. There you go, you're off and running. See what else you can find. I can never get enough of globes. And what I love about this one is this wood base. 
And you see a lot of these with metal bases, but that really stands out to me, it looks really smart. And it's got an older screw in there. It takes it away from the late 20th century, which I'm quite comfortable with. And also another giveaway is what places are depicted and what they're called as they've changed over the years. So we've got the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. So it's earlier than 1991 then? I think this has to be 60s, not later than 70s. Really nice thing. Spin it. I'm going there on holiday. I hear Kyrgyzstan is lovely at this time of year. No price on that either. Well, that's two things now. Let me keep looking. He's on a roll. Now, just down the road, Ms Cooper's got to Gloucester in a shower of rain, appropriately. And once she gets her brolly to go down, <laughs> she'll be taking her £395 for a spin around Gloucester Antique Centre. Forty dealers have a pitch in here, one of which is selling some of Margie's favourite stuff. I always go to the silver, don't I? <laughs> Yes, but this lot is a bit special. A Sade in Exeter. We started with the assay mark in 1300, and we're the only country in the world that has a mandatory system. Every item has to be marked to make sure it's got the right soil content. Why we needed so many assay offices was that people had to travel to get their stuff assayed. And that was quite dangerous, if you can imagine. You know, you could get burgled on the way. It got a whole lot safer in the 19th century, and sadly, Exeter went to the wall in 1883. But like this here, this is an Exeter. That's a stuffing spoon. And that's a lovely clear hallmark. That's £280. Now, if that was an Exeter, it'd probably be like £120. Gives it that extra kudos once the assay office has closed down. Yeah, very nice. I love to look at silver. Let's leave her happy place and see what Chuko's up to. Wow. That stands out, doesn't it? How different is that? I love objects for objects' sake. It doesn't have to do anything, it's just beautiful. Looking at that grain has to be oak, I'd say. And hold on. He's seen something. It's getting interesting now. Better get your bins on. Oh. Right, there's a name on there. I think it says Brian, I can't quite work out. Brian Wilshire, quite a renowned abstract sculptor. His work was sold in Liberties and exhibited at the Royal Academy made all his wooden sculptures just using a bandsaw. Those shapes, those geometric shapes, really say the 50s to me. So maybe it's somebody that was influenced by that kind of modern art time of the 50s, but I really like that. It's really striking. It's got £28 on it. Wow, if the right people see that at auction, it could be very interesting. It's a one-off. You'll never see another one of these. I really like it. That with the globe, with the mirror. If I can get the price right, has to be a profit. To find out, you'll need to talk to the owner. Hi, Vic. Tuco, good to meet you. What a lovely place. Thank you very much. I found some good bits in here. I'm pleased to hear Unusual it. bits. I love that, that 1973 wood sculpture. Yep. You've got a great globe in there, I'm thinking 50s, 60s and you've got a fantastic mirror upstairs, lovely weight to it. What could you do for the three of them? 55. 55. I am not going to argue. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Very generous, Vic. Let's make that 20 each for the globe and the mirror and 15 for the sculpture. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Bye. Nice to meet you. That's him done then, still with a nice round £500 left in his pocket. And as he waits in the car for Margie, She's busy tackling another cabinet. Now, I'm not trying to copy anybody, <laughs> but who bought a cocktail shaker? Chuck, that's it, Chuck I bought one. He did very well, didn't he? Just a bit. Made him over £200. And this one's got a spout, which is great for pouring. Much easier to pour with that than it is with that. I have bought many of these, and they're very popular. Cocktails are in, and so they're quite, yeah, give it the old shaky, shaky. It's going for 59. Now, if this gentleman will give me a deal on this, I'm going to buy it. And if it goes down, we'll all have a good laugh, and I'll tell him how lucky he was that he got so much for his cocktail shaker. <laughs> Lee is the man you'll need to speak to. Why don't you sashay over there now? Lee getting in the mood. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> right, cocktail shaker. 
59 pounds so I, I i'm not going to bid i'm just hoping that you're going to come up with the price that i'm thinking over here i think the very best on that one i could do is 39. that sounds fine in right. fact i'm in a very good mood oh please <laughs> we know that so keep the pound oh, thank you very much are we sure margie hasn't had an old-fashioned or two <laughs> thank you thank you cheers <laughs> best luck and with 355 pounds left she's done too time to head for the hills all bought up done and dusted yeah can't do any more no i don't feel as confident I shouldn't say that, should I, really? Oh, I feel really confident. <laughs> <laughs> we believe you, Chuko. Shut eye, I think. Welcome a cool and eclectic city that's been home to Isambard Kingdom Brunel, Blackbeard and Banksy. And for one day only, a couple of anxious antiques experts. Here we go again. <laughs> You ready? I'm happy about this one. Oh, Should be good. Well. Our chaps who scoured Worcestershire and Gloucestershire for goodies, and now they've brought them to Bristol, where they're going under the hammer at East Bristol Auctions with a busy sale room and bidders online and on the books. Margie parted with £180 on her five auction lots. Let's ask today's auctioneer, Jay Goodman Brown, what he fancies the chances of. And be sure. The three 19th century Crimean War jugs. Um, nice set, to be honest with you. Nice bit of history. Sadly, there is a little bit of damage. However, the gilding, the pictorial imagery is there, so hopefully we'll still see these make good money. Chuko forked out a lot less on his five items, just £105. Favourites, Jay? The wooden sculpture, really nice piece by Brian Wilshaw, sculpted in the 1970s. Uh, he is a prolific uh, London artist, very much got his inspiration from Barbara Hepworth and Henry Moore as well, so I expect to see this hit quite big money today. Sounds like it's going to be a good one. Grab a few. We're about to begin. Sign this is as well. I pounds. always am. Are you? <laughs> at 40 then. Yeah. Well, let's kick off, or whatever the equivalent in lacrosse is, with Margie's sporting goods. Somebody start me at £30, if you will. Start me at 20 then. Any interest here at 2020 is <laughs> bid, thank you now. At 20 pounds then, any advance or are we all done on the maiden at 20? Got out of the chair. <laughs> <laughs> it's a profit. Chuko can't give you any stick for that. It's Shan't be bad anymore though. <laughs> it's a learning curve. Chuko's up next, his five pound paperweight purchase. Somebody start me at 30 if you will. Nice piece, start on. me at 20 in a way. Any interest? 20 I'm bid online now, thank you. At 20, I said two anywhere. At 20, 20 pounds for the paperweight then, on the maiden at 20. Not a bad return for your cheapest buy. She's done OK. Uh, I'll be back, Charges, can you really? Pounds pounds in the pot. Now, Margie's hoping for a run on this bank. Somebody start me at 10 pounds. <laughs> Start me at five then. <laughs> Any interest here at five? Five is a bid in the room. Yeah, at five the pounds room. then. You can't seven. be allowed. Eight. Oh, it's ten, sir. Would you like ten? <laughs> at ten pounds. <laughs> at ten in the room then, looking for twelve on uh, with our gentlemen <laughs> seated at ten. <laughs> any more for any more? Are we all done and selling? At ten then. That's that should have been more than that. She couldn't get her money out of that one. So I've made a five but oh, lost. Again, there for you some really nice. <laughs> That's example. nice. Next up, Choco's 20th century mirror. Fingerprints thrown in for free. You suddenly start me at £30. 30 I'm bid straight in on the net now. Thank you at 30 then. It says five anyway. At £30, I'm looking for five. Got me five. Or are we all done? On the maiden bid for the mirror then. At £30. Someone saw something in it. Good. I'll take that. The first of Margie's jug collection now. Her Dalton Harvest one. Somebody start me at £20, if you will. 20 I'm bid straight on the net now, thank you. At 20, straight then is there profit. two straight anywhere else? Profit, nice yeah. At 20 pounds after two, are we all done on the maiden and selling? I'm really doing well today. At... <laughs> hey, you're back in the black, so that's something. I'm making fivers like there's no time. Make it then to lose it. <laughs> Truco's Mantique now. His pond yacht is about to cast off. Uh, I've got commission interest, and I'll take it straight in at sixty pounds with me here on commission. Five seventy here with me. See your Come day back today. five, if you will, and they do eighty here with me again on the books. Eighty-five, ninety, 
five here with me. I'll take it still sure with me on commission. Is there one at £95 after 100 Are we all done? My buyer, 100 really takes that. it from oh my, my commission. Now. It's on the net then. Sailing away at £100. That is brilliant. I'm very happy with that. That was ship shape and Bristol fashion. Because we're in Bristol. Get it? I've got to come um, back to this auction house. I should be doing this for a living. <laughs> it's happy hour again. Was Margie's cocktail shaker worth that extra pound? And I'll take it at 45 50 and 5 here with me. Is there 60 Straight anywhere in. then? Come at on. 55 pounds, 65 here with me. Look. 70 if you will. At 65 pounds, still One more and with me. At 65 pounds and selling then. Well done, Margie. Brilliant. Oh, well, that's all right. Yes. <laughs> Much better than a fibre, Margie. That's all right. Don't be too much. <laughs> Now, can Chuko get a profit with this globe? Didn't cost the earth. <laughs> Somebody start me at £30, if you will. 30 and 5 and 40, I now bid then. 45, come back 50, if you will, then. At £45, are we all done? And be well sure. Well done. Not out of this world, but he more than doubled his money. Globes are always south. Yeah. Pounds, well done. Pounds, I'm very happy. Margie's last lot and her biggest punt, that trio of Crimean war jugs. Stand by. Somebody start me at £60. Lots of interest in these. So 60, 80, 100 is bid online. 110 yeah. now is there at £110 then for oh the three God, jugs. Let's go a bit is more. there 120 oh, on. at £110 oh, no. for the three and selling? Oh, at oh no, that's disappointing. It's bids. disappointing, but you took a risk and you I didn't did. lose. <laughs> and it was worth it to discover their story. You learn. Pounds. I've learned something. Yeah. £10 Pay to learn. Pay to learn. And finally, Truco's 70s wooden sculpture. The auctioneer has very high hopes for this. Lots of interest on the books and yeah. online for this piece. Should yeah. do quite well. Somebody start me oh, at £250. With me, sorry, at 250 300 oh, 320 no. <laughs> Takes it from my commission bidder, sadly, at three. <laughs> £120, 340 is a bid in the room now, thank you, sir. 360, 380, sir, at 380, 400, 420, at 420, come back 440 if you will, then internet bidder then. At £420, with the gentleman That's standing, bad, make no it? mistake of that. I'll count you down, internet, you're thinking well, about it, going once spotted. then, going twice at £420. Oh, I've blanched. <laughs> What a result! No one was more surprised than Chuko. <laughs> well, I, hats off. Your hat <laughs> off to you. <laughs> well, that's it. Game, set and match. That did tip the scales in his favour, just a little bit. Margie started this leg with £534, and after auction costs, she made a modest £4.50 profit. She now has £530. £39.16 and 16 pence for next time. But Chuko, who began with £605, had a bonanza today. After sale room fees, he has £1,004.82p. and Well done, that man! Wow! I like to say I knew all of the time that was going to happen. I saw that. A and funny I thought... little thing like that could make £420. That says it all, doesn't it? It was great. Oh, come on. <laughs> Next up on the trip, we're in it to win it. I want to spend big. Yeah, you need to. So you can lose big. <laughs> Chuko is Mr Supermodel. I'd be like here. And Margie gets a fright. Oh, my goodness. 